pleasure to have you all here today. My name is Leif Helmer. I'm the chair for the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. I welcome you to our annual science conference. It's a thrill to have you all here and um, I'm going to move through a few uh, welcoming, welcoming remarks and a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the, uh, the schedule for today. Uh, so first, a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we're gathering here and our, our research institute is based uh, today and, uh, and always in, uh, in Guestwick, uh, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, uh, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. So we acknowledge as an organization and as individuals <clears throat> the treaties of peace and, peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. Uh, as many of you will know, <clears throat> MTRI, or the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute, <clears throat> is based in the heart of Southwest Nova. Our field station is a hub of scientific work and outreach. It's adjacent to Kejimkujik National Park and National Historic Site of Canada. MTRI is also a cooperative of landowners, of researchers, and citizen scientists all working together to achieve our shared mission. That is to promote and conserve and sustain the biodiversity of Guestwick as well as beyond. And we do this through research, through education, and cooperation in events like today with numerous partners and of course, our broad membership. Our vision is to build a world without species at risk, where forests and waterways are healthy, invasive species don't spread and considerable areas of nature are left to sustain themselves. A world that, nature, that nurtures human society as well, where prosperous local communities exist and are sustainable for all future generations to come. Those are our mission and, and vision statements. And it's, as I said, it's a pleasure to have you here, an honor to have you here today to join us in this uh, convening conference uh, to bring science uh, to the fore. We're very much a science organization and we're proud of that. So just a reminder in terms of housekeeping for today, um, that uh, you please uh, keep your computers muted throughout the, uh, the presentations. Um, you certainly have the option to have your video on, and it's nice to see so many familiar and new faces. So please, uh, if you wish to have your video on, please do so. If you need to turn it off or prefer to have it off, that's fine as well. If you could introduce yourself in the chat, that would be wonderful. And um, the chat function is found uh, within Zoom, usually on the right-hand side. Sometimes you have to turn it on. There's a little uh, thought um, bubble above the word chat, kind of... Uh, the middle of your uh, option bar at the bottom of your screen, and then the chat will pop up and you can introduce yourself. The chat is also the place for questions. So if you have questions for any of the speakers today, uh, we encourage you to post those uh, as they come to you. You can post them in real time right to the, uh, right to the chat. And Steve Mockford will be monitoring the chat and he'll be uh, bringing those questions to the speakers at the uh, conclusion of each, each talk. Uh, if you could, uh, this is a little bit of a kind of next level housekeeping. If you could put your first and last name in your Zoom profile, if it's not already there, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, that way we know um, who, who we're interacting with and um, we can um, just have a better sense uh, as, the, uh, uh, as things go forward. If we need to email you uh, a response to your question, uh, that will show up better if, you're, if your first and last name are in your profile. Uh, as well, presenters, you can put your contact information uh, and email address uh, right into the chat if you wish, if you'd like to answer follow-up questions directly. So uh, often you'll see uh, presenters with contact information in a slide, but you can also put it right into the chat. <clears throat> uh, there will be breakout discussions, including one later this morning, uh, just after 11 o'clock, and um, each participant will be automatically placed into breakout rooms when you, when you return from that uh, 11 o'clock break. Um, but we'll, we'll give you a reminder of that um, a little closer to that time. So uh, with those uh, housekeepings uh, and, uh, and welcoming remarks, I'm going to uh, soon now turn the floor to our first speaker. And I see that we're, um, uh, we're running just on time and this is a, this is a good start. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our first speaker for today. And <clears throat> that of course is James Steenberg. And James works with uh, Nova Scotia's Department of Lands and Forestry in their forestry division. And the title of James's talk is Managing Nova Scotia's Forests in a Changing Climate, Implications for the Triad and Ecological Forestry. So I'm gonna 
mute myself and turn it over to James and uh, invite you to take it away. Thanks, Leif. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and to, to give this talk. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to do so. Um, now bear with me. I've got quite a tech arrangement here. I'm going to share my screen in such a way where I might still be able to see my speaking notes. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay. And last question, are you seeing the full sort of title slide or are you seeing it with the speaker notes and preview? Just the title slide. Just the, okay, great. That's the way I was hoping for. So um, thanks for that introduction, Leif. Uh, my talk today is going to focus on um, climate change and, and forestry and in particular, um, the, new, the new buzz in, in forestry in Nova Scotia, which is um, ecological forestry and the triad approach to managing a forest landscape. I'm going to focus primarily on, on carbon. Um, it's been occupying probably most of my sort of research and analysis time these days. Um, but at the end, we're also going to touch on um, the implications of uh, the impacts of climate change and vulnerability and adaptation as well. So we're going to um, just sort of get into the weeds a bit today and, um, and talk through some of the concepts and, uh, of carbon in the forest uh, and also the implications um, for managing um, Nova Scotia's forest in a triad-based approach, uh, which I will define if, uh, if you haven't heard that term or concept before. Just a little primer for today's talk. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about these different pools of carbon and uh, the fluxes or movement of carbon across these pools. And, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road when um, uh, we're trying to use forests and forest management to, to fight climate change um, by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which forests have the capacity to do through um, the beautiful process of photosynthesis. So the carbon pools that I'm going to be talking about a lot today, um, just as a, a refresher or a primer for people, uh, is the living biomass. And uh, that's, that's the term used to describe, you know, living plant tissue and the carbon within it, not the um, biomass that you may be initially thinking about. So just to uh, clarify that, um, but also... Uh, dead organic matter, so things like, you know, standing dead trees or snags, as we call them, and coarse woody material and other, other litter and, on the forest floor. Um, there's the carbon that's stored in the soil. Uh, and then, of course, there's the carbon that's stored in uh, harvested wood products. And now the carbon in, in soil and in, in products is it's dead organic matter as well. But we, we tend to break those out in the modeling because they have different dynamics and different uh, implications. So as I, I mentioned just at the beginning there, I'm going to um, look behind and then look ahead here. And we're going to see where the province has been going uh, in terms of uh, the ability to monitor our, our forest carbon over time uh, in the past. And then we're going to look ahead at the implications of implementing um, this triad approach and the ecological forestry. So there's, there's a number of different ways to model carbon and to track it over time. Um, and in the end, they come down to two sort of key sources of information, which is published uh, studies and, and literature that, that give us equations and rates of change and, uh, and abilities to turn uh, data that we do have into new data, which is our carbon data. Uh, and the data that we use to, to convert um, with those equations is from forest inventory data. So those that have done um, work with uh, forest data in, in Nova Scotia will know that there's two sort of big pools of inventory data that uh, we draw from. Uh, one is a, uh, a forest inventory from photo inter air photos that are interpreted into different um, aspects of forests. And uh, this gives us a snapshot, you know, every 10 years is what it's supposed to be, uh, the inventory cycle there. Um, and while it, it can be a little coarse in terms of accuracy and assumptions that go into interpreting, uh, you know, manually uh, these air photos, um, but it has full coverage of the province. And so you see here our map of carbon um, from the most recent air photos that we have, and you see some, some patterns that you might expect, you know, higher rates of carbon storage in some of our tolerant hardwood hills or where there's some more growing stock in, in the western region where you are, many of you are located, um, as you can see there. And uh, it's, these, it's this inventory data that feeds the, um, the modeling that looks to the future that we're going to talk about later. But there's also our historical permanent sample plots. And uh, there's you know, around 3,000 of them. Many of them go back to 1965. 
And while they don't have complete spatial coverage of the province, they have much higher uh, accuracy. And we use these to, to monitor trends, you know, in things like state of the forest reporting, um, but also we use them to build our, our foundational relationships of, of growth rates over time and rates of uh, mortality and, and turnover to dead organic matter and these kinds of things. And when we look at our trends with these, with these data, um, we can get a snapshot of Nova Scotia's carbon uh, in the past. And, and just following recent state of the forest uh, approaches, I'm just showing the past uh, four five-year inventory cycles here of forest carbon across two living biomass pools, uh, merchantable trees and saplings. They're differentiated in, in the inventory data. And then two dead organic matter pools, which are our snags um, and our, our coarse woody material. And in general, what we see is that um, we were dipping, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And then over the past uh, few cycles, there's been an, uh, somewhat of an increase in the living biomass carbon. Um, and I don't know if you can see my cursor as I'm presenting here. So I'll probably be pointing at things that you're not seeing, but uh, um, you can always, I can't see the chat as I, as I present, but uh, please do interrupt if something's not working, just let me know. Um, you don't need to see my cursor, but just if you see me cursing around. We, can, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, and then we also have our, uh, and sorry, I was going to say that these trends, you know, they very much follow um, the harvest rate that, that you can see in, in, in historical data from the department as well, which has gone uh, down, you know, especially since the, uh, the recession, 2008. And then our coarse woody material, you know, there's a little bit of potential data quality issues with this first round in the cycle. Um, that's when they first started measuring um, these new kinds of variables that, you know, as, as forest inventory and, and forest management in general started adopting more biodiversity principles and, and tried to, to follow more ecosystem-based management principles, we, we moved to measure more than just, um, you know, growing stock, but these other ecosystem attributes. So that started in um, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but over the past recent cycles, we see that these have gone down a little bit um, in terms of their carbon storage. When we look at carbon storage in, in the living biomass here across our ecoregions, you know, this, this graph here showed you the total sum uh, of all the carbon on the land base. So, you know, this really um, reflects changes over time, but especially reflects the size of a given ecoregion. You know, we're the Western ecoregion. Um, again, nice job, MTRI. Is kind of dominating the, the slide here. Um, and it's interesting to, to look at these because you need to understand the full picture of the province, but it's also good to compare, you know, apples to apples as well and, and look at these same data on a per hectare basis. So this, um, this graph is showing carbon storage in terms of tons of, of carbon uh, per hectare. And this sort of compares on an even keel, the different uh, ecoregion dynamics. And we can see here that it's that fundy shore that is kind of storing the most uh, uh, carbon uh, in more recent times, um, but you see that it has increased uh, very much uh, like the Western region has. And of course, we see other patterns like at the bottom here, um, the coastal uh, eco region tends to have uh, store less carbon. You know, they're, they're highly exposed to um, uh, uh, the climate of the, their coastal setting. And we see in eco regions one and two, uh, those are our uh, highland eco regions. Um, well, you can see that devastating dip there from the last outbreak of spruce budworm. Let's keep an eye on the time here. So that's kind of our trajectory is, um, you know, we've had some hits here and there. Um, the, uh, the, the more, more recent trends have been more carbon uh, on the land base, um, which is a good thing in terms of the forest ability to, to mitigate or fight climate change by removing that carbon from the atmosphere. So that begs the question, you know, what will uh, what will things look like moving forward? Um, just to, I don't I don't see the full list of participants. I imagine everyone here will be, have followed the news to some degree around the forest sector in this province. But just a, a bit of a primer and recap um, that the, the forest sector is in very much a state of uh, transition right now, uh, not least of all because of a, an independent review of forest practices that occurred right as I was starting with the department actually. So I kind of jumped into the, uh, the hot pot when I started working there. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an ongoing process and it's looking to implement um, all kinds of recommendations that, that sort of center around the, the concept of um, ecological forestry and uh, the underpinning principle of putting biodiversity first um, in, in the sort of planning and decision-making processes that, that drive our, our forest sector 
um, primarily on crown land was the focus. But of course, you know, uh, biodiversity and carbon don't care about land ownership. So this, of course, has implications for, for private land as well. And um, a reminder to folks listening that Nova Scotia, unlike the rest of the country, is very much a privately owned province where, you know, the bigger sort of central and western provinces have around 90% or more crown land. Uh, Nova Scotia uh, is about two thirds privately owned and about half in, in small woodlots. So in addition to um, this underpinning principle of, of biodiversity first is the um, one of the key ways to get there uh, while also maintaining the forest sector is this um, concept of the triad, which is really functional zoning of the forest land based in Nova Scotia. And uh, the triad, is, as the name might imply, has three, three legs to it um, that have three very different uh, purposes that, that to, to ideally balance forest values um, across the range of values that exist from biodiversity conservation to climate change mitigation and adaptation to um, uh, forest fiber production to recreation and of course traditional uh, Mi'kmaq values as well. So the three zones of the triad are the conservation zone. So this, this zone is on the one side, uh, you know, sort of no forestry, uh, so no management um, uh, for forest fiber. You know, in some areas there would be management for some other values like uh, recreation or, or those kinds of things. Um, uh, but the focus there is on biodiversity conservation. Um, on the other side of that range would be the high production forestry zone. So this is um, intensive forest management uh, where forests are in plantations. Um, and the focus here is primarily on fiber, but with uh, improved growing stock and intensive management. So ideally getting more fiber off a smaller bit of the land base. Um, and then the sort of the bigger catch-all uh, uh, zone, the third one, which is meant to be the largest zone is the ecological matrix. Um, so the matrix is the third leg of the triad, but also in my very <laughs> beautifully done uh, PowerPoint illustration that showed up there, the matrix also remember the meaning of the word it, that it's the surrounding matrix that's supporting little nodes or islands of, of other of other zones and the other two there being conservation and high production. But the matrix is a surrounding one. And as such, it has this balance of, of biodiversity, conservation and forestry and more of along the lines of uh, lighter touch you know, ecological forestry, where the idea will be on um, higher retention and continuous cover types of silviculture um, that needs to be done on, on crown land. Um, and the, the coarse um, biodiversity conservation concept of, of emulating natural disturbance regimes in, in the forestry that's done, you know, at the stand in the landscape level. So those are the three zones. Um, what do they mean? for the carbon futures of, um, of Nova Scotia. And that kind of sounds like you're at the stock market investing in, in carbon, but really what does it mean um, looking ahead and what kind of insights can we glean um, in, in research and modeling today? And, and you know, that's kind of what I've, I've been working on uh, as, we, as we move to roll ahead um, this, this triad. So across all three zones of the triad, you know, what, is, what are we trying to do from the point of view of climate change and uh, uh, climate change mitigation through forests and the carbon that they, they store. Well, really, I, I think the end game here is to remove as much carbon uh, as possible from the atmosphere and store it for as long as possible. And, you know, that, that sounds really simple and, and, you know, why not do it? But it's, you know, there's all kinds of different implications and of course, balances with other forest values. So let's just kind of unpack these across the three zones of the triad. And uh, when I talk about each of the three zones, I'm also going to sort of take a step back and, and look at a broader topic area um, that has implications for all three zones of the triad, you know, the entire land base, but there's just a good stopping point or segue from this particular zone for me to talk about it. So the conservation zone, let's start with that. Um, we can look at some examples. Uh, MTRI, you're a stone's throw from uh, one of our lovely conservation zones, uh, Kejimakujik and uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, I had my notes. Was it uh, protected in 1967, I think, which is uh, handily just a couple of years after some of the first uh, permanent sample plots uh, for forest inventory were, were put across the province. And these are randomly located across the province. So they accurately represent, you know, the sort of different area and would fall naturally in, in, in protected areas. 
And we see that, um, you know, from a, from a carbon point of view, um, you know, uh, conservation kind of does what we want it to do. It's it, maybe a more simpler one where in this case, we're not managing um, for, for wood products. And so we see it's a pretty good news story there for Keji and from the carbon point of view, the Highlands is, uh, is a bit of a different story, of course. Um, you know, the Highland is, is dominated by um, balsam fir and also quite a bit of white spruce as well. And these are host species, especially balsam fir of the spruce budworm. It's a, it's a native forest pest that has cyclical outbreaks, uh, you know, every about 30 years or so. And uh, there's actually uh, one ongoing right now in Quebec and uh, they're fighting it at the border of Quebec and New Brunswick uh, as we speak. So there's a bit of a different carbon picture there. And it's kind of a good segue to, to take a step back and talk about the implications of natural disturbance regimes and, and natural disturbance events for forest carbon across all zones. Um, but let's let's just stick with co um, conservation. So from the point of view of, of the carbon in just the zone itself, well, really the, the objective here, because it's not being managed and there's no um, uh, direct trade-offs here with, with um, uh, managing for wood uh, supply, Really, the what's going to happen here is is maximizing uh, the forest carbon on the land base that can be stored um, in the different ecosystem types of our province that happen to be within these conservation zones. Um, so, a lot of our forests, you know, when you see they're protected, this will mean a lot of increasing carbon. You know, as those forests um, return to more older, more mature, and more natural conditions. Um, but you know, if we're modeling this out a hundred years, you know, eventually that gets to a point where you've you've done what the land base can do in terms of fighting climate change is, is you've gotten as much carbon in a terrestrial ecosystem as you can do. And so it's kind of, you know, situation uh, resolved for the most part. Um, so when you compare that to um, a managed land base, and we'll get into this uh, a little bit later, that means that there could be uh, less net removals uh, from the atmosphere of carbon over time, even though you've maximized your storage. But that's okay, because um, the, the carbon sink or uh, tends to fo focus more on uh, forest restoration and moving towards improved forest management practices. Whereas in, in a conservation zone, we really want to get that storage to the best uh, it can be um, because that's, uh, that's the, uh, the end objective uh, as, I, as I talked about before. So because we're not balancing that with a wood supply, um, that, that's kind of an easy thing to do in terms of thinking about carbon in the conservation zone. But what about natural disturbances. Um, you know, it's, it's a challenging one and in some ways could be an ethical uh, uh, conversation around controlling natural disturbances because um, these are, as the name implies, natural disturbance regimes. You know, spruce budworm is a, is a native insect. Um, and, you know, for example, there, there is not nearly as much wildfire in, uh, in, in the Acadian forest region where Nova Scotia is uh, compared to the boreal forest. And, um, you're looking here at a graph of all of Canada, which is, you know, largely dominated by boreal forests. But there is some, uh, of course, we are very effective at, at suppressing uh, wildfire. And there are options for pest management um, to, to reduce the impacts of carbon. Um, and they are, they are severe, uh, you know. Uh, so in this particular figure that I took from the State of the Forest Report, um, it's, let me just scroll down on my notes here, uh, 2015. Uh, was around 250 megatons of uh, carbon emitted from uh, wildfire and insect disturbance in Canada. And it just so happens, coincidentally, that 250 megatons, that's 250 million tons of carbon, is about what Nova Scotia's forest biomass, the living part uh, of the forest, uh, stores in the entire province. So all of Nova Scotia being emitted. Um, now, thankfully, these are, are recaptured, uh, you know, uh, to, to hopefully to a good degree as the forest regenerates. But one thing we can know for sure is that um, not all of our natural disturbance regimes are natural uh, like they used to be. With climate change, we're seeing more frequent and severe uh, disturbances, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so that will tilt us off balance and is, and is a carbon liability as much as it is a biodiversity one. Uh, but we're also seeing, and you know, this has, of course, intersections with climate change, but we're seeing more introduced invasive species that cause the disturbance of forest and the release of its, its carbon. Uh, in Nova Scotia, it's no secret that we're grappling with the newly introduced uh, hemlock woolly adelgid that is affecting hemlock, especially in western Nova Scotia, where MTRI is. Um, but also here where I am in Halifax is the emerald ash borer, first found in Bedford. And 
I'm worried about that is the, the topic of my PhD was actually urban forests. And over my research career, I've, I've done lots of research on both urban forests and more sort of rural and commercially managed forests. And, uh, but they're still near and dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ash in, in cities and, and that's looking at pretty much uh, 100% mortality and, and the loss of that carbon, of course. Um, so let's take a, a step in again, away from the uh, implications of natural disturbance regimes for carbon. Uh, I should say that, you know, disturbances are monitored federally by the Canadian Forest Service um, to look at carbon emissions uh, from them. But, you know, they're looking at all of Canada and have some more coarse approaches to doing that. And forest protection for, with lands and forestry, you know, they, they monitor annually a lot of our natural disturbances. So uh, we have capacity and I think we're starting to move towards the direction of, of thinking about carbon as we, as we think about those modeling uh, and monitoring programs. But uh, let's take a step in again and look at our next zone of the triad, high production zone. So high production zone, this is the more intensively managed plantation-based forestry that I talked about, uh, sort of about the opposite end of the conservation zone, uh, which um, it, because of the stock that's being planted, they can store quite a bit of carbon, but of course, um, there are much shorter rotations, you know, uh, with the uh, high production scenarios that um, the lands and forestry team looked at, the high production forestry team uh, that was uh, working on a discussion paper and uh, that should be a uh, second one should be released soon. You know, we're looking at uh, anywhere from 35 to 50 year rotations. Um, so there tends to be at the, uh, uh, less carbon storage at the landscape uh, level, um, but a decent amount of uh, carbon removals during the rotation time. But there's a lot, you know, so what does that mean um, uh, from the, the, our end game there, you know? So there's a lot to unpack and, and let's do a little bit of that. Um, of course, one of the, the strategies I should mention as well is um, longer term storage of uh, carbon uh, as, a, as a byproduct of a higher recovery of um, solid wood products compared to um, shorter lived products like pulp and paper. But let's, uh, let's move into some of these areas with, uh, with the white spruce scenario here. So you're seeing in blue there the living biomass of white spruce, which is a 45 year rotation. And this is the, the carbon storage, uh, I should say, not the, the, the merchantable volume of, of white spruce. And there's a commercial thinning happening at, uh, I believe, year 30 there. And this brings me to something that, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of carbon research over the years before. Um, I worked at Dow before coming to Lands and Forestry. Um, but when I started with Lands and Forestry, this was a new position, um, uh, the carbon and climate change modeling. And I, I was immersed in all kinds of new dialogue and discourse that I wasn't aware of before. And, and one was the sort of split between um, what's better uh, for climate change, carbon storage or carbon sequestration. And uh, I, I actually find it a little, a little frustrating at times because it can simplify a lot of things which is, are often quite complex. So I, I try to, to move away from that, if anything, to just avoid heating up the fire. But really, it's, I, I want to move towards you know, full carbon accounting of every little molecule of carbon in the woods, um, uh, whether it's harvested or not harvested in whichever zone of the triad it's in. So that means I tend to think more in terms of um, uh, the ecosystem uh, productivity. Um, and so there's, there's three sort of metrics uh, for, for modeling carbon for productivity, and that's net primary productivity, ecosystem productivity, and biome productivity. Net primary productivity, that's kind of your, your carbon sequestration as, as it was traditionally um, uh, 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 um, described in this sort of storage for a sequestration battle. And, and that simply means that, you know, older forests store more carbon, uh, younger forests sequester more carbon, but store less of it. Um, uh, so that you can see where there would be uh, issues surfacing with that kind of uh, false dichotomy. Uh, not that the dichotomy is true, but with that simplification. So what we want to look at is, is where does all the carbon go? And so if we look at net primary productivity, so just this simple sequestration, this is the, um, the cumulative, uh, this graph I just put up there, the cumulative removal of carbon from the atmosphere by photosynthesis, the, you know, subtracting the amount that's released by cellular respiration. So there it is, right? Um, but if we look back at our, our carbon curve for white spruce, well, Something's not quite right here, right? The, the after one rotation, it goes back to zero. 
Um, where did that carbon go to? Um, in, in net primary productivity, it isn't accounted for. So we need to move a little bit further than that for, um, for having a full picture, looking ahead with, with a triad in our carbon. And to do that, and uh, I hope you're, you're sitting down, it's gonna get a little hairy here, but I'm gonna walk through where, where that carbon goes and why we need to track it. And to do this, I, I rely a lot on the, um, the carbon budget model, the Canadian forest sector is developed by um, Canadian forest service scientists, uh, the federal government. And, and it, it synthesizes all kinds of research on dead organic matter and the rates at which it flows uh, in the forest. And so I got a red spruce here and you know, it's the, the living biomass uh, carbon, you know, that's, that's the easy part to model because it, 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 it's based on stuff that we've always been measuring and, and, and equations that are well established in the scientific literature. Um, so we, we, we can do a pretty good job at that, um, but it's the dead organic matter you know, that's going to make or break you when it comes to that end game for, for managing a forest carbon, right? And it's it's also got more uncertainty because it's based on assumptions from, from research in different areas, for example, and it's based on assumed rates of, of change. And it's the best that we have, right? But uh, we need to just sort of understand the implications. So my little red spruce here, uh, our provincial tree, uh, for the sake of research and illustration today, we're going to whack it uh, and we're going to track where all the carbon goes in terms of dead organic matter. So the wood uh, piece, you know, that's gonna go, uh, as a forest grows over time, uh, you know, uh, there's a constant turnover of, of our living wood uh, components to um, snags, so our standing dead trees. Um, and of course, when there's a disturbance, like our poor little red spruce here, um, it also goes directly to the coarse woody material on the forest floor, uh, if it's knocked over. Uh, and as snags are standing, there's a constant uh, rate of, of falling litter, litter fall that's transferred from snags to coarse woody material as well. And we tend to just lump bark in with uh, that wood pool in, in CBM based modeling. Our branches are kind of the same where we've got this constant uh, turnover in the forest to the branches of, of standing dead trees. Uh, and then that uh, has a constant turnover rate to our fine woody material on the forest floor. And of course, uh, uh, a major disturbance harvest or natural is going to put some directly into that pool on the ground too. The foliage has a, like the others, has a constant litter fall or you know, rain down of, of uh, leaves that die on an annual basis, uh, of course with deciduous trees, but also in conifers. Um, um, uh, that goes to our litter pool. And uh, our fine roots and our coarse roots, well, that's a pretty simple one there, although there's some more detail there that I just don't include today for the sake of illustration. Uh, and there we have it. That's where our, our um, constant flow of uh, material, of carbon into de dead organic matter goes. Um, and then, of course, it decomposes. And it decomposes at rates that are based on the kinds of material that we have here. These different pools all have very different rates of decay uh, and also based on our, our climate. So as these decay, most of that carbon uh, goes to the atmosphere through um, uh, heterotrophic decomposition. Remember that one? Um, uh, and, but a, a good share of that also goes to the forest floor. And so the forest floor is a big pool of carbon. Uh, you know, this is the, the FH horizon there um, uh, on top of the uh, mineral soil, and that stores a lot of carbon. Uh, some of our, our dead pools go directly to our deep mineral soil. And the mineral soil is the largest pool of carbon, and it's quite often uh, a larger pool of carbon than all the living stuff combined. And then there's this very important flow uh, of transfer of carbon from the forest floor to the mineral soil. So in sum, our, our spruce that we knocked over here, this is the transfer and rate of that carbon uh, over you know, 150 years here um, uh, and its, its ultimate fate um, to the atmosphere. But as you see, this slowly growing uh, uh, carbon pool uh, in the mineral soil as well. So we need to keep track of that carbon if we want to get a full picture of what our forest is doing across all zones. The, the dead organic matter spiel there was my, my step away from the high production zone to all three, um, but we're just going to continue to illustrate it here with high production. Um, so we need to, to keep those emissions from, from the dead organic matter. And you can see them there in orange that um, uh, they're a constant source of emissions. You know, that it's not alive. It's dead organic matter. So it's not sequestering carbon. But as it accumulates on the landscape, it can be a, a net sink as well. And then um, that gives us a better picture of the carbon, but not all of it because we're taking some of that carbon out of the woods. So we need to track our, our wood product carbon as well. 
And uh, that's where we move from net primary productivity, so just sequestration, net ecosystem productivity factors in our, our dead organic matter, uh, carbon emissions, and in this case, the emissions are negative. Um, uh, we call them carbon removals. And then we need to also factor in those emissions from decomposing uh, harvested wood products as well. And so that gives us a, a more clear picture of uh, factoring in the carbon that's stored on the land base, but bringing the temporal aspect of sequestration uh, that we want to have, um, you know, because we're thinking ahead in, in terms of time series, um, but without oversimplifying and uh, without missing any of the emissions. But for the astute observer, you might have noticed that I didn't include soil carbon in, uh, in those, those examples of uh, the high production carbon curves. And the soil one's a tricky one. And, and a, a starting point that we need to address is the concern of long-term decline in, um, in soil carbon in managed forest, and especially under uh, shorter rotations. And that's, you know, that's established in the literature, both in sort of broad meta-analyses like this one here, but also in some local studies as well. Um, and you know, that could be concerning. We don't have, the soil pool is uh, the hardest one to model and, and has the most uncertainty, um, but it's, it's the biggest one too. And you know, from a very coarse approximation from soils from CBM modeling, a 1% drop in, in soil carbon is about equal to all the emissions that Nova Scotia's industries emit on an annual basis. So it's big, um, but we need to understand how the CBM model works and how we can and model this soil carbon to, to understand uh, the implications of modeling it and what it might mean and how to avoid uh, soil carbon declines. So this is a simple um, uh, carbon curve for a, um, a typical um, stand over time. And, and as we see the way that CBM does the soil in gray, um, uh, by the way, the one that starts at zero is the living biomass. My dotted line got kind of washed out on my screen. I don't know about yours. And the one that, that drops down here is the dead organic matter and then starts to accumulate again as the forest becomes uh, mature. What typically happens in, in the soil dynamics is you have this big pulse of dead organic matter after a harvest uh, in this case. Um, and and uh, there's a net gain to the soil carbon is all that um, pulse of dead organic matter decomposes but then the forest isn't producing uh, nearly as much dead organic matter in this sort of middle period here. And you have a decline below pre-harvest levels and then eventually return to ideally to pre-harvest levels at the end of this simulation. And so that's based on this CBM assumption that um, how it initializes uh, carbon on the land base. Because CBM doesn't start with a map of all the soil carbon in Nova Scotia. It needs to rely on um, this initialization process. And, and what it does, and what you see here, I think is, uh, I can't really see the edge of my screen because of the, the little thumbnails, but um, yeah, 1600 years of carbon modeling over time. And uh, it just re-simulates your carbon input data, which is 150 years. Um, and you see here this dead organic matter uh, in dark green on the top, just re-initializing until the, whoop, all right, the soil pool settles and becomes uh, sort of in a steady state condition, and then it begins a simulation. And that, that simplification of the initial conditions of the forest land base uh, can be worrisome. And so we're, we're continuing to work on that to improve our estimates so that we can include them explicitly in all the modeling uh, that we do. But it's very much a work in progress. You know? So as a starting point, uh, we, can, we can rely on the rates of change from, from the CBM uh, uh, scientific model but we need to understand where, where we're coming from too. And so we have um, the soil surveys data from the feds, which is kind of dated, um, but it, it provides a bit more of an accurate picture of our starting point, although they never surveyed the highlands. Um, and then our soil scientist that works for lands and forestry is constantly taking um, uh, soil samples and, and depth measurements to try, and of course has our, our soil uh, ecosystem classification. And we're constantly trying to improve that layer and, and, and work it into the carbon modeling so that we can get a better picture and know where our, our vulnerabilities are. Moving into the matrix, and geez, I'm running tight on time. I better keep, uh, keep going here. Um, our matrix zone, if you recall, this is the lighter touch silviculture that, that um, emulates natural disturbances and, and focuses more on um, multi-aged uh, stands and, and multiple cohorts and continuous cover and higher retention. 
Uh, this tends to lead to, to more carbon on the land base, of course, than, than the uh, high production forestry. And uh, from the point of view of vulnerability to climate change, like increasing uh, natural disturbances, um, it has uh, more structural and, and species diversity, which um, provides resilience to these kinds of things, uh, which is good on the adaptation side. It's a, a talk for another day. Um, but, you know, for the poor carbon modeler, it's a lot harder to, <laughs> to understand and model these very new and very complex silvicultural regimes. And so I've been working on this a lot uh, lately, uh, of course, and uh, kind of compare it to uh, in the video game when you start out uh, and you got to work your way to fight the boss at the end of the video game. So, you know, the old school sort of uh, even aged uh, um, a single cohort, single species rotation based forestry. Um, you know, we, we know the issues with that, but, but man, it was a lot easier to model in terms of its carbon. And then getting to the boss is, is getting to our new uh, irregular shelter woods and these new um, silvicultural prescriptions that will be happening on crown land. And as you see here, this involves um, initiating new cohorts of, of living carbon and, and tracking older ones uh, as, as there are um, partial uh, harvest there in the irregular shelter woods but also tracking all of our dead stuff and our, and our forest uh, carbon in, in products uh, over time as well. Um, but we, we can take that same approach. We can look at our net biome, uh, net biome productivity to get that full carbon piece. And um, interesting thing here, and this will be my last sort of uh, digression away from the triad to a broader issue of uh, this being, um, uh, what does this mean at multiple scales and at different, different scales, spatial scales of, of consideration? So interesting here that this particular regular shelter wood in a, um, a mixed wood uh, Acadian stand on, on uh, richer site conditions um, is, is, a net, is a net sink. And, you know, at the stand level, um, most, I, I would say almost all of our prescriptions, uh, depending on ecosystem type, but in, in zonal ecosystems will be a net carbon sink, which is great. But you can't only consider things at the stand level. You know, it's a nice simple picture where it's, you know, everything happening on a per hectare basis and you're starting at zero all the time, right? We need to consider the complexity and realities of, of also thinking at the landscape level. So interesting that it's uh, this irregular shelter wood is a bit less of a carbon sink than the high production white spruce stand over time from the point of view of net biome productivity. But when we scale that up to the landscape level, uh, the, the, it, can, it can toss that on its head and there are other considerations we need to, to think about. So when uh, one is, you know, simply when, when you start counting your beans, when you start modeling the carbon, um, in this case, uh, for example, for high production forestry. So this is something that we're working on and uh, as, a, as a high priority research item is to do a full carbon triad analysis of, of the province, um, but it's a work in progress. So I have made up numbers for the sake of illustration today. So what you see here is two made up landscapes. Um, so, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of hectares at the, at the broad uh, scale. Um, and so if we start counting our carbon uh, in, in high production forestry at the landscape level, at the time that the plantation was initiated, or for example, let's say high production forestry is only initiated in areas that were uh, recently harvested um, before we started our modeling. Well then, that's the orange line here, case two, where it just the carbon just accumulates to, to, to sort of a balance of what you get with, with those, um, uh, those regimes that I showed you. Um, but if the carbon modeling and accounting starts um, at, the, at the, um, the initiation of the idea of the triad, and when you start to uh, convert over areas to high production forestry, and there's an initial harvest before um, the high production is established, well, then you have this scenario where the carbon on the land base will go down as there's a transition to that high production zone and then come back up again. So whoops, that, that paints two very different carbon pictures here, which you see on the right. And um, in the, the case two, that simple one where we're starting at zero, which is more similar to that stand level, well, you're, you're kind of a net, you're net sink and that's good, right? Um, but in, in the case where you have this transition period, uh, you're, you're essentially taking money out from the bank. You have this carbon debt of that transition that needs to be repaid and can at the landscape level drastically change that carbon picture. And um, uh, if we look at this, you know, from the point of view of the ecological matrix, uh, we can think of another thing that must be considered at this broader landscape level, which is what, uh, what did you inherit in terms of your forest land base and, and the inventory that you have from decades and centuries of, of past management? Because that history 
will drive the carbon picture for the next century as much as any new management that will be happening. So in Nova Scotia, you know, if we have um, from past management, you know, thinking back to, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, because of that, if we have a younger forest on the landscape, um, well, then implementing the uh, ecological matrix and ecological forestry is guaranteed to uh, lead to a more mature forest. Uh, and in this case, that means a forest that's always uh, getting more and more in terms of carbon storage and is therefore always becoming more and more of a carbon sink in terms of net biome productivity. So that kind of flipped things around for you. And it's these, these things that matter is, you know, you need to build this carbon picture from the bottom up, but then you need to implement and look at it at this broad picture and, and, and consider it in landscape planning. Um, that's a lot of carbon to dump on you. And I'm aware of the time. Uh, I think only at five minutes. So climate change impacts, I mean, these are critical. I'm gonna go through this just a little, a little um, quickly here um, because it wasn't the main focus of the talk today, but I wanted to really focus on one key area. Um, so I'll move down to, uh, well, I'll touch just quickly here on, on natural disturbance regimes and the issue that they're becoming more uh, frequent and severe. And so under the forest practices review, there was a team formed to look at what our historic disturbance regimes have been and to characterize it with the best data that we have so that ecological forestry can, can emulate these disturbances. And this research is ongoing. I, I've taken over uh, as the, the lead of that team um, since there was a retirement. And we're looking to publish a second study now, which, which will map some of this so that it can really inform at the landscape level, especially this ecological forestry and, and emulating natural disturbances. But how do you emulate something that's changing under a changing climate? And that question opens up a whole can of worms. So we have a lot more research to do there uh, as well. Um, You've seen some of these before, so I'm going to skip it and move to my last example of climate change impacts, where I um, put together a little infographic and went went a little crazy with my PowerPoint animations. But um, you know, the immediate sort of foot on the fire in terms of climate change impacts that we're already feeling are, are um, extreme weather and and uh, more frequent and severe disturbances. But the long term uh, concern um, and impacts, especially for the Acadian forest, where we have a mix of you know, more boreal and colder climate species and more temperate and warmer climate species um, is that some of these species may no longer be suited to our future climate. And that could lead to, you know, um, obviously impacts on biodiversity, uh, slower growth rates as, as trees become less adapted to, uh, to the climate that they're growing in, and maybe even uh, changing uh, trends in forest succession and composition uh, at the landscape level uh, over, over decades and centuries, which is a big deal. So let's just look at this from the point of view of, of growing degree days. And um, that's a metric of, of growing season length. And it's, it's really just the accumulation of, of days and temperature. Uh, so, you know, five days of 10 degrees uh, would give you 25 growing degree days because growing uh, seasons start at five degrees Celsius. So they'll, even though there's only 365 days in a year, this can get into the thousands because it's that accumulation of temperature and, um, and, uh, uh, days. So what they do, though, is the high and low of your growing degree days give you a kind of snapshot, both of the current growing season and climate of Nova Scotia, and also of the geographic range of tree species and the climates that they're able to grow in. So what you see here is um, a map of some of our uh, uh, hardwood species. And um, on this bar across the center are the growing degree days of the current climate in Nova Scotia. Uh, so the in between these two little triangles. And if we look at these uh, uh, hardwood or broadleaf species, I should call them, um, we see the range uh, that they currently grow in climatically. These are their climate envelopes. Um, and we see that red maple, you know, it, it grows in Texas and Florida, uh, whereas, um, uh, you know, yellow birch and sugar maple, a bit more of a northern temperate uh, hardwood. And what we can do then is take some of our forecasted uh, climate change models, you know, that are ultimately derived by um, IPCC scenarios, and look at what future climates could be compared to the geographic range of these tree species. And uh, in our RCP 2.6, so this is the um, you know keep emitting but then start to do better uh, scenario for climate change. Um, you can see where that those that range of Nova Scotia moves uh, compared to the range of these trees, and you can see that when we go to the uh, oh crap climate change scenario, uh, the RCP 8.5. Well, Nova Scotia, uh, you know, red maple and red oak may be doing okay under this, you know, obviously simplified 
perspective of only growing degree days and their range, but uh, yellow birch and sugar maple um, start to get kind of in a bit of trouble there. And then this same example with some of our um, conifer species, uh, red spruce, black spruce, balsam fir, and white pine, and, and their current uh, distribution up there at the top. Um, well, there's our same exact climate of Nova Scotia currently, and the scale in the middle has changed, so it's in a different spot, but we'll implement those same climate change scenarios for these species. You can see that white pine uh, is, you know, uh, it, it's a pine that grows in more warmer climates uh, towards the south, but black spruce and balsam fir, you know, Nova Scotia is, uh, is about as warm as they get, uh, looking at their only their climate envelope. And then when we look at these climate change scenarios, well, we can see here some potential issues, especially for black spruce and balsam fir being well out of the, right, the uh, bounds of, of that forecasted climate in the last few decades of uh, 21st century. So um, that's a lot to cover today. And uh, I wish I left more time for questions because I love talking about this stuff. I don't know if there's still a bit of time, but um, uh, I'm gonna just put up my contact stuff here and I'll put it in the chat after this is done. So um, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk here today. And uh, I don't know if, if there's not time to take uh, all the questions that there are now, definitely email me and, and I can follow up as well. Great, thanks James. And uh, much appreciated. I know we were tracking questions um, and Steve Mockford may have one. I saw one was posted recently. Um, we are right at 9.55. So um, we'd have to be a brief uh, question there, Steve. Otherwise we'll move to the next presenter and we can ask James to answer. I'll, that well, I'll ask this one question, Leif. Thanks for a great talk, James, for starters. Thanks. The question was, new research is indicating that soil mycorrhizae are controlling most car soil carbon relationships. Is there, work, is there ongoing work to understand the influence of mycorrhizae under different forest management approaches in Nova Scotia? Uh, if there is, I don't know about it. Um, you know, my, my understanding of, of soils is, is cursory, you know, to be honest. It's really just from the point of view of carbon and how we model it at these broad scales. But I don't have a soil science background at all, so I, I just don't know. I would I would contact um, maybe I know John Brazner is interested in that stuff, and I saw him on the list here. But I, I would also maybe contact our, our soil scientist Kevin Keys. Actually, it was John who asked the question. Oh, hey, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, there, there's a couple of other questions, mostly for me, but I think we'll leave it at that point for now, James. Great. I'll hang around just for a little bit and, and punch in some answers to the chat if that's all right. Sure. sure. Thanks again.